Hello and welcome. I'm Jerry Haig. In these video clips edited down from Super 8 movie shot during the late 1970s and early 1980s in East Central Saskatchewan, we see some of the problems associated with working with wild moose at that time of year. The stories are written in this book of mine of moose and men, the wildlife vet's pursuit of the world's largest deer. I hope you've had a chance to enjoy my two previous pieces, moose bulldogging and leading a wild moose. Our summer study was designed to see if bears were affecting moose calf survival as they do in Alaska, for instance, where bears may take up to 80% of calves in the first month of life. This picture, painted by the world-renowned biologist the late Tony Bubenik, shows an encounter that he witnessed in Ontario. Our work base was at the Department of Natural Resources field station called Mountain Cabin, situated on a rise near the junction of highways 55 and 9 at the southern edge of the Saskatchewan River Delta. Team leader Bob Stewart had assembled his team of Don McInnes and Ray Longmuir to work with us. My part was to monitor the condition of the animals and to capture the adults so that we could put radio collars on them. Each morning we took off and flew north to try and locate a cow-calf pair. Our first attempts were not very successful. The calves had as many moves as the finest running backs in the Canadian Football League or an international rugby wing three-quarter. When Ray did his face plant, we decided that a change of tactics was needed. We eventually figured it out as pilot Cliff Thompson was able to manoeuvre the calves into any one of the many small bodies of water in the delta where they could swim with ease, but could also be readily caught and pulled into the helicopter cabin, as you see Don and Bob doing now. As soon as the calf had been caught, and while Don held it in what passed for dry land, it was my job to dart its mother. She had seldom gone more than a couple of hundred meters, and this part of the process was pretty straightforward, as we had well-established protocols in place. As soon as the cow was down, we brought the calf to her and held it against her. We quickly put a tiny solar-powered radio transmitter on its ear, using a fast-drying epoxy. As well as the radio transmitters, we attached bright streamer tape to the ears of both mother and calf as we knew that finding them again in the thick summer foliage would be difficult. Within 10 or 15 minutes, we would inject an antidote into the adult and let the calf go. The mother would get to her feet in about a minute as we watched from the air to be sure that the pair linked up again. Happily, they all did. After the first day, we not only made new captures, but used a receiver connected to antennas mounted on the skids to monitor all the animals on their individual frequencies. Those streamers certainly helped. An unexpected opportunity arose for us to test the calf transmitters as two little calves that had been abandoned came to us. We found one right near the cabin, and here you can see Don giving Mickey as he was quickly named, a bottle of milk, just before he headed off to the Forestry Farm Zoo in Saskatoon. Mickey and his new buddy Bullwinkle arrived within a day of one another and were soon acting as our research guinea pigs. This story and many others are all told in my book of Moose and Men the wildlife vet's pursuit of the world's largest deer. It was published by ECW Press of Toronto.